It's early spring 1943 and the US is at last finding its footing in the war in the Pacific. Devastated by the sneak attack on Pearl Harbor, the US Navy was forced to concede territory after territory to the superior Japanese Navy. For a year, the American destroyer USS O'Bannon had been on the front lines of the Second World War, doing its best to buy time for America's new fleet to be built and launched. The Battle of Guadalcanal has proven pivotal for American forces, and though the Americans lost a great number of forces, it resulted in a strategic victory for the US Navy, which saw attempts to reinforce Japanese bases repelled. For some, the war is officially in an upswing, and the momentum of battle is shifting across the war-torn Pacific. America's sleeping giant is well and truly awoken. Little of that matters though to the war-weary sailors of the USS O'Bannon. Early in the morning of April 5, 1943, the O'Bannon and the rest of the destroyer squadron 21 is returning to resupply and refuel after shelling Japanese installations on the Solomon Islands. As the O'Bannon is cruising along though, her radar picks up a contact somewhere near a small set of islands called the Russell Islands. While both the Japanese and American navies make use of radar, American radar is better integrated into the ship's systems and more well developed than the Japanese' own. This is largely thanks in part to the close cooperation with the British researchers and an agreement between the US and Britain that gave America access to British radar technical know-how. Another reason for the better performance of American radar is that the Japanese Navy placed a greater emphasis on traditional combat postings over support and logistical personnel, so the more talented and experienced officers would end up in combat positions rather than behind radar monitors where they could further refine and develop both techniques and technology. On that fateful day, American radar superiority would prove fatal for a submarine full of Japanese sailors. The O'Bannon's destroyer squadron is pretty confident that the single radar hit is not a sizable Japanese ship, likely something small like a corvette or even a submarine as air assets would have spotted a larger Japanese ship in the area. Perhaps even it was a Japanese resupply ship trying to speed through the naval blockade on Japanese island strongholds. Either way, sub, corvette, or supply ship, it was a tempting target and the O'Bannon immediately changed course to intercept the contact. As the American destroyer approached, its lookouts on the deck quickly identified the radar contact. It was a Japanese sub, cruising along the surface and completely oblivious to the incoming destroyer. Incredibly, the Japanese crew had failed to post a lookout. Either that or the sub was desperately low on battery power and could not afford to submerge. Either way, this was not an opportunity the O'Bannon's captain was about to give up and as he ordered the ship to increase speed, he set the big destroyer on a collision course with the sub. Given the much greater tonnage of the destroyer versus a small Japanese sub, ramming the sub would completely destroy it while leaving the O'Bannon relatively unharmed. As the O'Bannon bore down on the Japanese sub, it became clear that there were no lookouts posted, and as the ships got closer to each other, the O'Bannon's lookouts were stunned by what they saw. Over a dozen Japanese sailors splayed out on the deck of the sub, apparently napping. By now, the O'Bannon was within a few hundred feet of the submarine, when the captain feared that this sub might be full of sea mines. If that were the case, then ramming it would set off the mines in the ship's hull and send both vessels to the bottom. Frantically, the captain called out for a course change, and the O'Bannon barely managed to change course in time to avoid running straight into the Japanese ship. Now both ships were running side by side and the Japanese crew was very much alerted to the presence of an American ship. In a panic, the Japanese sailors began to prepare the three-inch guns on the deck of the sub to fire on the destroyer. The O'Bannon, meanwhile, couldn't bring her own deck guns to bear on the sub because she was too close. If something wasn't done quickly, the sub would seriously damage the O'Bannon and potentially even escape. The crew of the O'Bannon realized they were in serious trouble, and they immediately began grabbing at anything they could get their hands on to throw at the Japanese sailors. There was nothing on hand though, except for several barrels full of potatoes. And then the men began pelting the Japanese crew with the potatoes. For their part, the Japanese were so confused by the potato attack that they began to throw them right back at the Americans. Perhaps the Japanese thought that the Americans were throwing grenades or that the potatoes were secretly explosives of some kind, cleverly designed to simply look like potatoes. Whatever the case, the two crews, bitter enemies of the Second World War, began an epic food fight as both ships struggled to flee from each other. Preoccupied with throwing the potatoes back at the Americans, the Japanese sailors never got a chance to man their guns, and the O'Bannon successfully pulled far enough away to start lowering her formidable guns on the sub. For its part, the sub had begun to descend. The above deck crew rushed to get below decks before they were caught out and drowned. The sub slipped below the waves, but not before the O'Bannon let loose with a volley of fire that smashed into the sub's conning tower. 
The shot through the conning tower likely doomed the ship immediately, but to ensure its kill, the O'Bannon returned and delivered a depth charge attack directly over the sub's location. Japanese records after the war confirmed that the sub was in fact lost to the O'Bannon's attack. Hearing of the crew's exploits, the Association of Potato Growers of Maine had a plaque commissioned and sent to the crew of the O'Bannon. The plaque would be hung in the mess hall and read, a tribute to the officers and men of the USS O'Bannon for their ingenuity in using our now proud potato to sink a Japanese submarine in the spring of 1943. Presented by Potato Growers of the State of Maine, June 4, 1945. While an incredible story though, the O'Bannon's commander Donald MacDonald would later say that no potatoes were ever actually thrown by the ship's crew. Rather, upon nearly ramming the Japanese ship, the ship's cook commented that it was so close he could throw a potato at it and hit it. The potato story, however, was a hit with the American media, who was perhaps looking for some levity in a war that brought so much horror to so many. The story became nationally famous and the Great Potato Battle of the O'Bannon remains the stuff of naval legend to this day. Now that's it. Now go watch Rent an Army. How much does it actually cost? Thanks for watching and don't forget to click on the like button. We'll see you next time.